Well, welcome to the bestseller stage at Word on the Street. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here again. My name is Mary Ito. I'm the host of a show called Fresh Air. It's on CBC Radio 1. For those of you who don't know, so I really appreciate uh, people listening and even coming out for this event. Um, I would like to introduce this fantastic panel to you today. When I was asked to host this and I saw who the talent was, I was so excited to be a part of this event. We're going to talk today about genre fiction because that is what these authors all do. They do genre fiction. So let me introduce them to you. Uh, and then each of the authors is going to tell you a little bit about his or her book. And then that will be followed by a panel discussion. If we have time, we'll do a Q&A, but we'll just see how the discussion goes. So first off, to my immediate left, is Joy Fielding. And she writes in the genre of crime mystery. She is the author of over 20 books. <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't. No. Oh, that's what that was like. I would say psychological suspense. Oh, see, that we're already, we're gonna get into this. <laughs> psychological suspense. All right, this is like tomato, tomato. But anyway, um, psychological suspense. I might get corrected on each one of these, actually. She is the author of over 20 books. Uh, her latest is actually her 24th, I just found out. Um, including the New York Times bestsellers, Charlie's Web, Heartstopper, Mad River Road, CJ Run, her bestsellers go on and on. I don't have time to name them all. Her novels have been translated into many languages, and she divides her time between Toronto and Palm Beach, Florida. And her latest book is called Shadow Creek. Please welcome Joy Fielding. And next to Joy is Elle Marie Adeline. That is the pseudonym for best-selling author Lisa Gabriel, formerly of CBC, one of my colleagues. She's a producer on Dragon's Day, yes. I'm assuming they are under your own name because I know you've ghostwritten a few books as well. She writes in the genre. Now again, it's officially on the schedule here that you are erotica romance. Would you agree with that? Sure. Yeah. All right. Dirty books. <laughs> All right. The, uh, the erotica romance dirty book genre. And her novel is called Secret. It is a number one international bestseller. The next in the trilogy is Secret Shared. Now, is that coming out next month or in November? Uh, October 15th. Okay, October 15th. That's the next one. And uh, Lisa lives in Toronto? All right. And I hope please... to divide my time between Toronto and Palm Beach. And <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, please welcome Lisa Gabriel. <laughs> and next to Lisa is Jay Kent Messam, and he writes in the thriller? I'll take that. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. The thriller genre. Uh, Jamie has done almost everything. He's been a session musician, producer, DJ, bartender, office gopher, movie grip, labor, and he told me a few other things he's not going to admit to. He was heavily involved in the music and film businesses for well over a decade. Fate is his first novel and he lives in Toronto. Please welcome Jay Kent Messer. Last but not least, Susanna Kearsley writes historical fiction. I write cross-genre fiction, so I write, uh, there's, there are two stories going on usually in each of my books, one's contemporary, one's historical, there's adventure, there's romance, there's suspense, there's mystery, so I'm a marketer's nightmare, because I'm everywhere, so. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that a little further. Uh, she's also a best-selling author with, is it 10 books now you're up to? 10 books? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 10 books to her credit. The Winter Sea was Susanna's breakout novel. It made number 11 on the New York Times combined EMP bestseller list in June of 2011. Her book, The Rose Garden, was nominated for a Rita Award last year. And Susanna, you live in Toronto? I live in Whitby, so in just Whitby. half an hour to the east. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Susanna lives in Whitby, and her latest novel is The Firebird. Please welcome Susanna. <laughs> Uh, I think going to start with Joy. We'll just go down the line here. They'll tell you a little bit about their latest book and do a short reading. I'm going to just tell you very briefly then about Shadow Creek, which uh, is my last novel. And uh, it's really in kind of the thriller mold. I do kind of move around in the genres as well. So this is um, the story really of um, 
a rather unlikely group of people who find themselves on a camping trip together in the Adirondacks at the same time that a couple of crazed teenage killers are uh, on the loose. Uh, it's just kind of your typical everyday story. And um, in, in this particular story, um, I have to try to remember everybody's names. Val is a soon-to-be divorced woman and she's um, still longing for her ex-husband or her soon-to-be ex-husband. She's having problems with her teenage daughter, her 16-year-old daughter, uh, who is supposedly going on a camping trip that weekend with her father and his new fiance, but because of a rather complicated set of circumstances, Val ends up driving uh, the new fiance and her daughter as well as a couple of friends out to the Adirondacks for this trip and, and they end up on this rather kind of weird camping experience. And uh, the, the section I'm going to read, very, very minimal, is a very tidy segment, so I hope it makes sense, uh, is really the prologue to the book where um, we are introduced to an elderly couple. I, call, I, I say elderly under advisement since I'm getting up there. But um, it is an, an elderly couple who live alone in a kind of uh, out of the way area of the Adirondacks. They don't have any immediate neighbors. And, so, and there's this violent storm going out, uh, going on around them. I mean, the book starts very with a very deliberate reference. It was a dark and stormy night. And uh, they find themselves, suddenly there's a knock on the door, and in comes this teenage girl who's standing there on the other side of the door looking again rather purposely uh, like a little Red Riding Hood. And uh, there's a storm raging around her, and uh, they invite her in because they really don't have a lot of choice and she's kind of made herself very very comfortable in the cottage and um, the uh, the couple Ellen and Stuart Lawfer are now starting to have like a few misgivings about this rather odd young woman so uh, Ellen says maybe you should try calling your parents surely the girl had a cell phone in her canvas bag what for well, to tell them you're safe, to let them know where you are, tell them where, where they can come and get you, she added, trying not to put too noticeable an emphasis on this last point. Nikki shook her head. No, I'll be all right. I guess you don't get a lot of visitors. Not a lot. Ellen agreed. We're a little bit off the beaten track. Oh, you're telling me. You don't get scared living out here all by yourselves? Well, there are some cottages not too far down the way, Stuart said. Fair enough, far, far enough. Where's your TV? Nikki asked suddenly, her eyes once again scanning the large room. Well, we've never watched a lot of TV, Ellen told her. Oh, I couldn't live without a TV. I get so bored. So, you guys have a gun? Why, why on earth would you have a gun? Stuart asked. Well, you know, for protection. Why would we need protection? Ellen asked. Oh, you obviously haven't heard about those people who got murdered last week in the Berkshires, Nikki said matter-of-factly. What people? Stuart and Ellen asked together, their voices overlapping. Oh, this old couple in the Berkshires. They lived alone miles from anyone, just like you guys. Somebody butchered them. Ellen realized she was holding her breath. Hacked them to pieces, Nikki continued. Oh, it was pretty nasty. Police said their blood, their... The place looked like a slaughterhouse, blood everywhere. Oh, it was in all the papers. You didn't read about it? No, Ellen said, glancing at her husband with eyes that said, get this girl out of my house now. <laughs> Terrible thing. Apparently, whoever did it, they almost cut the poor guy's head right off. Here, you want to read about it? She grabbed her canvas bag from the floor and fished inside it, retrieving a piece of neatly folded newspaper. She unfolded it carefully and handed it to Ellen. Ellen glanced at the lurid headline, Elderly Couple Slaughtered in Remote Cabin, and the accompanying grainy black and white photograph of two body bags lying on stretchers, surrounded by grim-faced police. Why would you be carrying something like this around, she asked. Nikki shrugged and pushed herself off the sofa. She walked into the kitchen. What's going on here? Ellen wondered, trying not to overreact. I, I think we should call your parents, she heard herself say, barely recognizing the tentativeness in her voice. I can't. I'm not getting any reception on my cell, and your phone's dead. 
there was a second silence. How do you know our phone is dead? Ellen asked. Nikki smiled sweetly. Oh, because my husband cut, because my boyfriend cut the wires. <laughs> then she marched purposely to the front door and opened it. A young man filled the doorway. As if on cue, a streak of lightning slashed across the sky, highlighting the coldness in his eyes, the cruel twist of his lips, and the polished blade of the machete in his hand. Hi, babe, Nikki said with a giggle as the young man burst inside the cottage. Meet tomorrow's press clippings. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I had a hard time figuring out what I was going to read this morning. So I was like, yeah, up to there, then no, then not that, then that, then not that. So, um, but I'm actually going to read from Secret Shared, which just uh, caught off the presses. I'm very excited. Um, and it comes out October 15th. And it's just a little summary uh, opening. Um, this, the Secret is a, is a sort of um, an idea born from... Um, I was, uh, I think, I, and I've told the story a few times, I was... Uh, working on, a, I was ghostwriting a book by one of the dragons, and um, and it was vexing, and it, it uh, was difficult, and uh, my editor's here, who can attest to that, um, and we were both lamenting the, uh, the fact that, you know, we loved working together, it was the second book that we collaborated on, and, um, but we were lamenting the fact that we hadn't yet really worked on anything that we were having a lot of fun with, I mean, it, work was edifying and challenging, but it wasn't like joy and fun, and this was during the sort of the height of the Fifty Shades of Grey phenomenon. And, you know, I just sort of casually said, I should probably write one of those books. And she's like, why don't you? I was like, a dare. And I thought, why don't I? And, um, and then so I did. I, you know, went away that weekend. I said, well, I'll come up with an idea. I'll put together a proposal, you know, a couple pages and an idea over the weekend, and I'll see what you think. Um, and that's what I did. I wrote in the, I was flying to Sault Ste. Marie for a family reunion, and I wrote in the airport. And then actually, as a flying porter, and in the airport lounge, no less than five women were reading um, the, a book that sort of features S and M, just like this, you know, like in the, in the lounge. Just, you know, the, and when I was growing up, we were we properly help hit those books. So I was like, okay, you know, it comes me. So uh, yeah, I presented it to my editor Nita, and she loved the concept and the idea, and we worked together on the book really quickly. And uh, thinking it would just be this little sort of intimate feminist tome that would get sort of ferreted away on a low shelf and it turned into this um, you know international thing and uh, you know things have changed <laughs> for me and in a profound way um, and uh, and before I actually continue I just want to say I, I probably won't ever get a chance to say this again when I published my first novel Tempting Fate which in Napoli about uh, 12 13 years ago Joy Fielding um, called me up um, out of the blue to compliment me on this book that she read. I wrote it, and, and this, you know, this massive, famous writer, you know, calls you up. Says, I'd like to take you out for lunch. We went to the By the Way Cafe on Fleur, I'll never forget it. <laughs> I don't remember what I wore. <laughs> because it doesn't really happen that often that writers are that generous, let alone um, as complimentary. And since then, you know, she's blurred my second book and has always been um, such a support and enthusiastic guide and um, anyway I just want to say what a thrill it is for me to share the stage with you. So I'm going to read a little bit of uh, Cassie's uh, chapter. Uh, we leave Cassie heartbroken if some of you have read the book, some of you are probably angry because <laughs> um, she didn't get her happily ever after in book one because it's a trilogy. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I can say that. Uh, so, and uh, will she get her happily ever after? Uh, probably. It's just going to take some work because you know happiness doesn't come that easily in my world, sadly. Um, so uh, we wake. Uh, Cassie is six weeks after her decision to join this underground group of women who help other women fulfill their sexual fantasies with men, mostly. Um, but. Um, and it's sort of, sort of given this feminist tinge and tone, um, which I'm um, happy to embrace, um, because I think it is you know, kind of veering away from the traditional uh, erotica romance uh, genre, but it's heading in a direction that I'm, I'm comfortable writing in, and it's been, it's been fun, as they say. Three thoughts occurred to me that morning while stretching awake across my bed in Marini. One, it had been six weeks since that incredible night with Will, Will's her boss, she's in love with him. Two, I had fallen asleep with my secret bracelet on again, which hadn't been a problem when it only had one or two charms on it, but there were ten now, so the gold pressed into the tender flesh of my wrists, leaving marks. And three, it was my birthday. My cat Dixie blinked at me from the foot of the bed, 
I reached down and pulled her into an embrace where she had purred herself back to sleep, a skill I wish I had. I'm 36 years old today, Dixie, I said, scratching her ears. Another year had snuck up on me like a bratty prankster. I hadn't been paying attention to time passing until after my night with Will. Time had begun to slow. Some days ached past. We worked at the Cafe Rose being both a major comfort and the salt in the very wound I needed to heal. How could I get over Will when I saw him every day? How could I continue acting like nothing had happened between us the night I danced at the Fee de Frenchman Review? Though he didn't know it, I had chosen him in that night. He knew only how bad. He knew only how badly I had wanted him. For me, the lines between fact and fantasy had dissolved, and he became very real to me. Uh, dirty part, dirty part. Uh, <laughs> that was a beyond fantasy. <laughs> um, and to think that all this time he had been right under my nose and I hadn't seen him, couldn't see him. But after a year of secret, after a year of pushing myself past self-imposed boundaries, I had unleashed something very real inside of myself. And when Will told me that he and Tristina had broken up, I felt the universe finally aligning in my favor. The morning after our night, I thought Will was my reward for coming back to life, and I was wrong. More than any other memory from that night, it's Tristina's face that haunts me, ashen yet hopeful, her steady voice delivering the kind of hard facts that kill fantasies. She told me she was pregnant with Will's baby, and that he was thrilled when he found out. What do you do with that very real information just when you think you found the love of your life? You feel the final bubble burst around your fantasy, and you walk away. That's what I did all the way across the city to the coach house where Matilda dried my tears. There she reminded me that embedded in every fantasy is reality. People love the fantasy, she said, but they ignore the facts to their detriment, and there's a price to pay when you do that, always. Fact number one, Will and I were finally together. Fact number two, I was quite possibly in love with him. Fact number three, his ex-girlfriend was pregnant. Fact number four, when she told him, they got back together. Fact number five, Will and I can't be together. Because Will was my boss, I had planned to quit my job right away, but Matilda urged me never to let heartbreak get in the way of practical concerns, like work, paying rent, being responsible, and fulfilling your obligations. Don't give men that much power, Cassie. Get on with the task of living. You've had a lot of practice this past year. I was such a tear-stained mess that morning, I wasn't certain whether joining Secret was the right decision, but at least I was making a decision. That was new for me. Prior to Secret, I always went with the most powerful force governing my life at any given time, usually my late husband, Scott's. He had brought us to New Orleans almost eight years ago, but his drinking erased any notion that we'd made a fresh start. We were separated when he died in a car wreck. He was sober at the time, but a broken man. And I was broken as well. And for five years after, I worked hard and slept fitfully, falling into a pattern of isolation and self-pity until one day I found this diary detailing one woman's journey through a mysterious set of steps that seemed to have a lot to do with sex. A journey that was transformative, transformative to say the least. And then I met Matilda Green, the woman who became my guide. She said she had come to the Cafe Rose for the diary her friend had dropped, but really she came for me to introduce me to Secret, an underground group dedicated to helping women liberate themselves by granting them fantasies of their choice. Joining the group, letting these women arrange these fantasies for me, finding the courage to go through with them, she said. That'll pull me out of my ways, and it did. Uh, she told me she'd help me, guide me, and support me, and finally, after a week of turning the idea over in my head, I said yes. It was a reluctant yes, but it was a yes nonetheless, after which my life changed completely. We'll leave it at that. How's everybody doing? Good. I'm not gonna be up here too long, but don't get the wrong idea. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm the dude that wrote Bait. <laughs> First novel, um, what to say about it, it's, uh, it's a book about six strangers that wake up on a deserted island in the Florida Keys, and they have no idea how they got there, they have no idea why they're there, and they slowly begin to figure out that the only thing they have in common is heroin addiction. And then they find a box on the sand that's got a note in it that simply says, if you want your next hit of heroin, you've got to swim to the next island. They're not going to do it, but as the hours go by, withdrawal symptoms start kicking in and they're finally forced to swim this channel to the next island. And madness ensues. Um, I wrote the book, I had this idea. Um, you see a lot of, uh, in television and movies and, and books, 
Uh, people use the threat of death to motivate people, like you know, the Saw movies and stuff like that. I was wondering, what would motivate somebody without that threat? If you gave them the one thing that they wanted more than anything in the world, the one thing they couldn't live without, or thought they couldn't live without, how far would they go to get it? And what happened was this novel bait that I wrote, which uh, got picked up in uh, Penguin US, by Penguin US, Penguin Canada, Penguin UK so far. So it's blown up way bigger than I ever thought possible. Uh, don't really know what to do about it, actually. Still trying to digest it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, so that's the premise of the book. Uh, it's a little gritty, maybe a lot gritty. <laughs> it deals with some tough subject matter. Uh, a lot of it was based on my own personal experience um, in the neighborhood that I live in. I live near Queen and Sherborne, which is an interesting no man's land. Uh, and my own personal experience is being in the music business for a long time, where I saw a lot of the dark underbelly of that world while I was in there. Uh, and drawing on those experiences, I, I drew on these characters. And I'm going to read a small excerpt from the book about one of the main characters, Nash. And this is uh, chapter two. And uh, what the book does is, in the early stages, it flashes back between the present and the past. And this character, Nash, this is a few days before uh, the island scenario is going down. And he's a heroin addict, and he's in a supermarket trying to shop for his, his food for food. What alarmed Nash was how much no-name stuff he was putting into his grocery basket these days. It was a time, and not too long ago, when he would have insisted on some brand names among his purchases. Some things he just didn't crap out on. Ketchup, mustard, mayo, mac and cheese, margarine maybe. Now all he looked for was the cheapest alternative, willing to undercut any provision he once enjoyed with its poorer, dumber cousin. Nash picked up a bottle of ketchup. Heinz, he said, looking at the label. There are no other kinds. But there were other kinds, for less than half the price, too. The names were suspect. He'd never remotely heard of them. Some had writing on the labels and languages Nash had never even seen. Some Middle Eastern or Indonesian crap or something he thought as he dropped one of the bottles in his basket. These shopping trips were where Nash felt most pathetic. Budget stretched so thin that it was floss compared to the kind of money he'd once dropped upon the time. His eyes moistened as the full realization of the situation sank in once again. He looked at the discount peanut butter brands, gritty and oily, reserved for the poor. Rock bottom, he mumbled. So unbelievably broke all the time. That's what he was. When he was lucky enough to get some money, he couldn't stay in his wallet for more than a few hours before he pissed it away or blew it up his arm. The more he thought about it, the worse he felt. Shame coated the bottom of his belly and lead and crammed the smooth muscle around his heart. Nine out of 10 addicts never recover. Nash never liked those odds. Thank you very much.